Thank you very much, Dr. Matthews, for spending your Saturday morning with a little bit with us, too. And uh, we'll be, he addressed a lot of good topics. I wanted to say, too, that uh, Dr. Selby and Alex and I met with Dr. Matthews a few years ago, and he agreed to be somewhat of a liaison between his interventional cardiology group and our, thank you, Dr. Matthews, and our CT surgeon, because oftentimes if we receive a call from a patient who uh, has said that they were viewed as not stentable, um, perhaps open heart surgery is needed, then we'll refer to Dr. Matthews first, and then he will analyze, triage the situation, and determine if he or his colleagues can do PCI or some other intervention. If not, then refer to CT surgery, so that's part of our process, and we're going to, excuse me, we're going to talk about that in um, the, the presentation that Alex and I will now give, focusing on the administrative management of our program, and we've put down quality assurance. I remember... Uh, years ago, getting involved with the Bloodless program, it was always the director of business development that oversaw the program. But as things have uh, really grown nicely, we have more quality initiatives, quality assurance. So even reporting to Dr. Hall, who focuses on that, has been a, a great help to our program to make sure our focus really is on good outcomes. So <clears throat> that's kind of the platform for our discussion as well as Dr. Selby talked about process. So just getting into it, uh, first slide. Thank you. <laughs> so it truly is uh, a lot of teamwork, as, as you know. The inter interdisciplinary collaboration that we have with various departments. So first of all, our admitting first line admitters, making sure that we have good identification of the patients a lot of materials that we have in those departments so that we can properly enroll the patient into the program. Uh, working with our ambulatory clinics, we have several of them now here downtown, as Dr. Hall mentioned, Beverly Hills. We don't work with Beverly Hills office as much, but the Pasadena Clinic there near Huntington, um, as well as uh, the blood bank in the lab. So we have a good working relationship with our uh, transfusion medicine associates here. Uh, very key. Oftentimes, if there's an issue, they will contact us on our emergency pager or our office phone to make sure that uh, we're aware if some patient, one patient or another, was not identified properly. And that has been very helpful to mitigate some of the fallouts. Working with our nursing partners, uh, Alex has done a nice job this past uh, year in servicing our different nursing units to make sure they understand the policy and process, which I'll show in just a minute. And just going through this operating room, obviously, Dr. Strong and Dr. Selby talked about surgery and anesthesia, very important. Um, and so anesthesia services. So we have uh, on the surgery schedule, there is in the medical alert column, it says transfusion free. And this is very helpful so that the anesthesiologist and the surgical team is aware a few days, hopefully a week or so before, that a transfusion free patient is coming in so they can prepare accordingly. And then pharmacy, I believe Dr. Selby in his presentation showed our list of the products, treatments, and alternatives, albumin, cryo, and so forth. So we may have talked about this before. Whenever a patient signs that form, anything that is not acceptable is entered as an allergy. Uh, that way we can, again, minimize the situation where they may receive albumin when they say they don't want albumin or some other product. And then uh, our transfer center, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Dr. Hall mentioned that. It's very important for us to have a good interactive relationship because the good majority of our patients that come here are not just through an ambulatory visit, it's through a transfer from another community hospital. So this is a very key uh, part of our collaboration with our transfer center team. And then of course we talked about quality and outcomes management. So now getting into some other nuts and bolts, um, some of the things that Alex and I do, we conduct policy and procedure audits, the policy and procedures, uh, policies and procedures that were developed maybe 24 years ago, so we revise them as it relates to current practice to make sure that we're consistent with what we're, we're doing in real time. Um, we just recently revised the policy for minors, and so that policy underwent some significant revision a couple of years ago uh, with our legal team too, as far as court orders and issues uh, that may arise that way. Uh, oh, sorry, education for a physician and nursing staff, hospital staff. Physician relations, so it was mentioned before that I think we have about 600 plus physicians on faculty, Dr. Hall, roughly. And right now we're about uh, maybe 115 or so that work specifically with our transfusion-free program. 
and that's key. And one reason why we don't publish on our website um, the, uh, the doctors that we refer to uh, for our internal referral process to work best, we found it, it found it best to have uh, patients or yourselves contact us so that we can help guide and direct the referral. Sometimes, honestly, it's a matter of even rotating the referral. It is a business, and to some extent, so we have a urology group that has maybe five surgeons or colorectal, and all of them, or a good majority, work with us, so we like to make sure that they all have a chance to treat our patients. Um, so performance improvement, so again, a huge focus, and I believe this coming Monday we have a meeting talking about blood utilization with our quality and outcomes administrator, Dr. Hall, Dr. Selby, and a few of us, Alex, myself. So we're really focusing on uh, not just the transfusion-free patient, but the patient who is not transfusion-free because a good number of patients who are coming now are requesting not to have blood. Sometimes they'll be marked as transfusion-free when they're really not. Alex especially is on the front line making sure that the patient who is transfusion-free uh, understands the blood refusal form or that if they're not a witness to make sure they really understand what they're saying if they want to be transfusion-free because otherwise we might have some issues on the back end. And Dr. Selby so we talked about the, the dashboard some. So specifically, uh, we want to get into uh, the various roles. So physician referral, we talked about that a lot. Um, insurance authorization and eligibility, I believe that was asked a question earlier about uh, letters of authorization. Dr. Hall mentioned that, so we'll get into that. Um, physician to physician consultations. So I know you all have been uh, directed when you have a situation, perhaps at another hospital, physician is not as uh, uh, comfortable uh, with operating on a witness patient. Perhaps they're willing, but don't have the expertise. Um, how would that work with perhaps contacting one of our specialists who does have expertise to communicate with them? So I want to get into that a little bit and actually get your uh, feedback on how you think that process should work. Um, so this will be interactive as well, so feel free to stop us at any point if you have a question or a comment. Patient transfer, so we're going to talk about our transfer arrangement, how it works best, in addition to the uh, care management of the patient, whether it be an ambulatory visit or an inpatient, and then finally our patient experience, which we're really promoting that heavily to make sure that uh, our outcomes management is good even when it comes to cultural sensitivity. I shouldn't say even when, because that's very important. So, so this is our um, this is a slide with our operating policy. It is a clinical practice policy. As you'll see, uh, the effective date there was uh, May of uh, 1994, and I think Bob Avila and maybe a few others here were involved with meeting with administration way back then and helping to develop that, and then we've rev revised it maybe six or seven times since then. So the latest revision you see is July of 2017, and this does cover all the key areas, admitting and blood bank and nursing and so forth. So this uh, somewhat what the EMR looks like. If you see there, uh, it says in green, if medically necessary, would you consent to blood or blood transfusion? So every patient is should be asked that question, whether they're coming in for a dermatology visit, and sometimes they may be off-putting, well, I don't need blood to have my mole removed. But uh, that way, we have consistency with practice. If every patient's asked that question, and you see the three responses, maybe in the yellow below, either they request more information, maybe it's a complicated heart procedure, and I didn't know you have a program, I'm not sure what's with this, but I'd like to. And then they can call, us, call Alex or myself so we can discuss that with them. Maybe they will, uh, if they say they accept blood, so usual admission, but then no, obviously that triggers the transfusion-free uh, enrollment process. And this is something that uh, we're really excited about because after 20 plus years of the program, we've developed this referral um, uh, panel, or participating physician panel, if you will. Uh, many of the liaison members may remember meeting with some of the doctors way back then. But since then, we recognize that it's not just a matter of a promise to uh, not to give blood or in principle, but it's really about, again, outcomes and about understanding the cultural, clinical, and administrative process. So this attestation document, uh, we're rolling it out now. Um, we have a lot of our doctors who maybe you might say grandmothered or grandfathered in, but uh, just reading that statement that basically it's a document uh, attesting to the fact they will abide by the the principles, the protocols, the procedures of the program, and the, this is a two-page document. It goes through a lot of discussion about A&H, understanding of um, preoperative management, post-op management. So our goal, and Dr. Paul, help me out here, so with the Vanderbilt program, professionalism, 
we've adopted that. Uh, can you just brief, brief, briefly uh, speak on that? So Green Tree the literature has been done primarily out of Vanderbilt, and, and studies have been shown it was really driven initially by malpractice lawsuits. And they found that physicians that had frequent complaints by patients or their co-workers um, had a higher risk for malpractice. So they developed a database and they implemented a program which has become so successful that the program has been adopted by many hospitals across the United States, including Kent Medicine. And we uh, adopted the program two years ago Essentially, any complaint by a patient, regardless of the severity, or a coworker is processed through the program, two separate, because the data that and the study we've shown that the process for patient complaints is slightly different than it is for coworker, but each of them are addressed, and we have a, a essentially a pyramid which we've learned and over the years, and, and Vanderbilt has shown and has published on this that. If you bring to um, a physician data, data-driven uh, evidence that says, we know you had a bad interaction with the, the nurse up on 8 West, where they were somewhat short-tempered or maybe they were disrespect, whatever it might be. And um, we know you can, uh, we just want to show this to you, that tell you about it, and we know that you'll do the right thing. That often, just by bringing that information forward in a non-punitive way, 80% uh, 80, 80 of physicians will self-correct and will never have another event. Basically, we know about it, we're concerned, and we're sharing it with you. Then if another event comes up and they accumulate a certain number of events, we go into what we call a pyramid, where a physician will uh, maybe accumulate a number of events, and then we have a uh, peer coaching opportunity and then we show them data of how their performance compares to all of the physicians in the United States in that specialty. So for example, in emergency medicine, if I accumulated a lot of patient complaints because I'm short-tempered or whatever else, they would uh, actually graph my performance against all the emergency physicians across the U.S. And there's something incredibly powerful to see your red dot out of uh, 10,000 physicians who are here. We, we get uh, a, a change in the whole culture, and um, there are some special positions that, despite that, move up to the high, high part of the pyramid, and then we have the legal process. But by and large, 90%, 95% of our positions self-correct on the first. And so the, that's sort of the background of the program, and it's called our Professionals Program, and it's a, a commitment to practice at the highest level. We have sensitivity, communication, professionalism, and a sense of empowerment because we found that safety and quality goes up when you have a, a, a culture of respect. In those areas where you lose that culture of respect, they've actually published recently in um, the American Journal of uh, Surgery that complications of physicians with many, many complaints are higher. So that's why we're, we're combining this. We all know it uh, internally that that is probably true, but we've never been able to show it data driven. And now there is evidence to it. So now we have a program uh, that we've implemented here in Tech in the last uh, month, where we call it uh, our daily safety huddle. Every morning, all of the units get together and have a brief and one of the things that we report back are any safety issues, whether it's a safety issue with an employee, like somebody slipped on the stair stairwell because someone spilled coffee and didn't clean it up, to a patient safety issue, uh, a throughput problem, a um, mechanical issue, the air conditioning isn't working as well as it should, whatever it might be. And that tiered huddle program starts at the, all the units in the hospital, and then it goes up to the um, unit managers, collect all of that data, and then the final step of the tier, tier level is a presentation to the CEO, COO, the chief medical officer, and other executives for the health system. It includes your legal bills, it includes Norris, and it includes Keck. And every morning, I hear the high-level issues that need to be addressed. Those are tracked, and there is a plan and an execution of correction, and by the following morning, an expectation will be addressed. One of the issues 
that we have put on that uh, list is that we have a fallout. That, uh, you heard Dr. Selby re reference earlier. We might have a cultural fallout or somebody's um, designation or their wristband or whatever it is. That is reported to the level of the CEO. And the CMO. And the expectation then is that we go in and find out what happened, why did it happen, and maybe it's education. We'll ask uh, Randy or Alex to go in and do some education for that unit. Or maybe it's some uh, issue with our electronic systems, whatever it is. We want to know, and our CEO and I want to know, that they know the moment it happens so that we can get to it right away. And this has shown not only in our system, I mean, we're implementing this program based on a, um, the program that was developed at Intermountain Healthcare, and we've shown improvement in safety and quality and satisfaction. And so that's where we're, we're adopting those procedures. So I'm sorry I took so much time, but it was just important for me to. <laughs> it's a good program. We're really happy with it. It's, it. it saves us a lot of time. Things don't get lost or forgotten about because the, the tyranny of the moment, you know, how you're busy, you work, and next thing you know, whatever happened with that? And we realize it didn't get addressed. We don't want that to happen. We want to make sure we that we take care of it at the moment. Okay? What's the other one for? For which? Our professionalism program? It's a, it's a program that uh, most hospitals have programs where they have incident reports. But we've just morphed that into the, a professionalism where we collect that data and we send it to Vanderbilt. And they process it and they send it back to us so that we can act on it. Is there a name for that form? It's not a form per se, but the program itself is called uh, um, the uh, CORS, which uh, if I, it's the CORS program, it's the co worker. Observation and the PARS program. I can get you the literature on that. I can, if, you, if you give us an email, I'll forward that to you. Okay? Thanks. Thanks, Alec. Appreciate that. So, as I said earlier, you know, directors of business development used to uh, oversee this program, but now having a focus on quality assurance is even most important for our, for our outcomes. So, thank you for sharing that. So, that's what we hope to accomplish with that document, too, and we're rolling it out. And, we hope all of our physicians will embrace it uh, wholeheartedly. So we'll talk about physician referral services. Um, referral sources, so many of you here, we respect uh, the work that's been done by the members of the liaison committee throughout the country, you, you folks here. Um, when it comes to the patients who self-refer, we are noticing an um, uptake in that. They've identified the program, but some still come, Alex, right, and weren't aware that we had a program, and we, you know, we totally understand that, but we want to make sure that if they don't identify with uh, with our program, that we help them to appreciate what it is, orient them, and then move them along through the process in the best way possible. I won't go through the whole list, but the various ways that we have a lot of case managers who may contact us, especially for transfers, uh, insurance companies who want to transfer here, and then other transfusion-free programs, as Dr. Matthews, I think, articulated some of the community hospitals that may not be able to uh, take on the challenge of uh, some of the things he does or uh, other surgical colleagues. So. We're able to help with that. So I'm going to have Alex jump in in a minute, but first of all, when it comes to liver transplants, and it was mentioned some, uh, our process, so I'm the primary member of our staff that takes the calls for liver transplantation, and um, I won't go through a, a lot of things, maybe Dr. Silva would chime in too. It has become more challenging in the last uh, few years uh, for various reasons. So as I put this up, I like to have a discussion first off about the possibilities, realities, and limitations of a blood and liver transplant, cadaveric or live donor. As far as cadaveric transplantation, uh, bloodlessly, uh, I think we are one of the only hospitals in the past several years who have even taken on that challenge, and it's becoming more and more difficult. So the, the chance of a cadaveric uh, liver transplant without blood is, is very slim, you know, for various reasons, and you know, Dr. Selby can comment on that if you like. But as far as live donor, and I was talking to someone earlier, I think it was Mike Nichols about that. So with living-related donor, we um, still have that program going. You may have heard from a few years ago that the request was that the donor is not someone who refuses transfusion, which makes it challenging. Uh, and that's for various reasons. Um, the, when it comes to pediatric transplantation, and Dr. Silva, correct me if I'm wrong, um, that because you're taking the left lateral segment, so an adult, witness can donate for a pediatric patient, right? Good. 
necessary. Uh, would you like to comment at all about <laughs> our current status and why? Thanks, Randy. Well, um, since since our inception for transplanting witnesses, which was in the in the late 1990s, and we had a, a large string of witnesses who were who had witness donors, so witness donor recipient recipient payers, and at the time we started, there were very few programs in the country that were doing living donors at all, witness or not. So as that group of programs got bigger and bigger, then the regulations around donation started, around living donation got, maybe not the regulations, but the scrutiny around living donations got tougher. Then there were a few programs that lost donors, and they're, you know, Lakey Clinic and Mayo Clinic just recently lost a living donor, Colorado lost one, Mount Sinai. So as those things happened, everybody had the benefit of watching the response by both the medical community and the oversight agencies and the governmental communities. And it, it's, it's pretty terrifying, actually. And so those were, uh, I would say that every time that has happened, the institutions that, that it happens to or in which it happens get so much scrutiny, lawsuits, and it lasts, you know, often for several years. So I think it would even be more indelicate for a program to 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 have a witness donor that who, who the risk we would say would be probably a little bit higher than for a non-witness donor. Um, so it kind of put us out there two standard deviations on the limb, and so everybody started to feel very uncomfortable. Now, that I think we're we're revisiting that a little bit. For children, it's a little different issue because it's parent to child, and there's a certain level of, of desperation for a young child that allows a lot of forgiveness. Um, if Even if something untoward went that happened that wasn't really uh, have, did have blame attached to it. So we maintained that well, for the children, since it's a lesser operation, it's just a left lateral segment that we would go ahead. And I, I don't think we've had any pediatric kidneys, but I suspect that we do those as well with a living donor witness. For the adult side, we, we still have transplanted some witnesses, I think maybe about one every year and a half or so, uh, with living donors, and those have been non-witness donors. I think we recently just did one and actually had to retransplant him with a cadaveric. Um, but the patient did well in the end. So I think it's 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 an ongoing position. I think if, if we were talking about a cadaveric donor for a witness, we might consider it for an A, B, or a B blood type. For O's and A's, we just don't get them soon enough to in order to really be able to offer it to the patients because things are just so far deteriorated. It used to be that for primary liver cancer, you got upgrade points that that would put you at a higher level to get transplanted, um, a higher level than is proportionate to the failure of the liver. And so that was a benefit. But now they've capped that, they meaning UNOS has capped that off, and so that's less of a less of an opportunity for us now. So I would say that if patients are A, B, or B, we should probably get them listed. Um, unfortunately, we don't have many brother or sister programs that are willing to take up this crusade with us. And in spite of the fact that there are probably many centers in the country who could do it successfully because they don't have the competition for organs that we have in Los Angeles. So the Salt Lakes or the Seattles or the Indianas or some places in Florida, Vanderbilt, those could all theoretically be programs that could transplant witnesses as category recipients without that much difficulty if they knew, if they practiced the strategies. Unfortunately, it just hasn't happened. Um, so we're, I think we're still, there may have been one or two other programs that have ventured out there and tried it once or twice, but nobody I would consider that has any real experience or expertise at it. So as things stand now, you know, we still revisit the issue. What we like to have within the program is consensus and not majority vote. And I think on something like this, you need hospital consensus, you need the administration at the hospital, you need the dean's office, you need downtown campus, because as soon as you do something that's not broadly accepted and understood, you find yourself in a hole if it doesn't go well. So I, I think in, in this, in the context of this type of 
issue. It's really it really has to be broad shouldered at the highest levels because the risk ends up penetrating to the highest levels if something goes wrong. So, so that's kind of yeah, David. So there's a program that the states right now is live donor, in which the donor is an ongoing process. Have the program right now. Right. We're not we're not nervous about transplanting a recipient. So that that risk is you know all patients have that same risk. I think if, if we're we're somewhat likely to be able to do an A B or a B blood type in as a cadaveric in an adult recipient. We are absolutely willing to consider a, a living donor non witness for a witness recipient and a pediatric donor and wit and and recipient combination as witnesses. And I think the kidneys is pretty much the same thing for the kidneys, I think, except we're not doing any, any splits on the kidneys. It's just one organ or the other. Okay? Yes, sir. Councilor, did you say on a live donor recipients, would it be evaluated on the risk of patients? No, I think just for, just for pediatrics, we would, we would strongly consider doing a living donor pediatric with a left lateral segment, much less of an operation. A full lobe, it's, it's, it's a little risky. If you took... If you took 500 cadaveric liver, not cadaveric, I'm sorry, if you did 500 liver resections where you took out a lobe of the liver, then you're going to get, you know, one or two percent but not survive it. And so if you, if, you, if you transpose that same statistic over to a donor population where there's nothing wrong with the donor, it's a, it's a big risk. That's right, yeah. So hopefully... Helps uh, Oh, Vincent? So, so for for a kidney donor, we in a pediatric we, we do the pediatric uh, kidneys at, at CHLA also. Uh, so and we do the we do the donor here at the University Hospital and take the kidney over and put it in a pediatric recipient. So we would consider a, a trans. A, Transplant from a donor recipient population for a kid. Having said that, having said that though, the kids often get an organ offer fairly quickly, so you don't really have to stretch that much. Does that make sense? And and cadaveric kidney transplants are pretty straightforward. They're not that difficult, and the kids that are the recipients don't have coagulation disturbance and, and all the things that a recipient liver. Has. Adult living donor, uh, adult witness living donors, we, at this point we're not doing them. Cadaveric we would do, we would list as an A, B, or a B blood type. That's a lot of conditions, huh? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Is it, um, how long is it, is it, is there a timeline you can even imagine that taking place? Well, I mean, it's, I, you know, I suppose that fruits and vegetables were grown organically long before they were certified organic. So I, I you know, and there's a lot of, a lot of oversighting in healthcare. So I think it's maybe not a pipe dream. It may be, you know, a 10 year dream. I mean, I, I would. I don't know who the agency would necessarily be that does that. Maybe the AABB would want to do it. Uh, it would be great if if uh, it, it came from a. Well, it would be great if the witness community saw that as a non-advertisement, just an advocacy. But I, you know, I I can't say that out loud. <laughs> you just did. <laughs> All right, we we'll guess the inference. <laughs> Thank you. So again, hopefully that clarifies it somewhat. Just to move along, uh, what we do in regards to the process, so we have a distribution list specifically for the transplant program. So once uh, I'll talk to the patient and then we send this uh, demographic information, insurance information to that transplant intake department, and they'll contact the patient hopefully within, within five uh, business days, have their medical records reviewed by the hepatologist, uh, surgical review, usually is done by Dr. Yuri Ginnick, who is the surgical director for transplantation. I think most of you, uh, some of you at least know Dr. Ginnick. So that's that's our process. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, so then if the patient meets the criteria clinically and financially, we'll uh, bring them in. We do have a lot of patients, of course, coming from out of the area. And so, uh, unfortunately, we uh, have to let some know that, well, if, you're not a, if you don't meet criteria, then there's no sense bringing you in. Some will say, well, I still want to come in. And if they do, we work around that. But in most cases, we don't want to have someone coming from across the, the, the country if it's really not feasible. David? Good point. One thing that uh, we've talked about, Dr. Silver, Dr. Ginnick, a lot of us is uh, the, the earlier, the best, the better. So some might be a meld of seven and said still <laughs> send the records and come on in because once you're melding at 20s and you know higher than oftentimes, we had someone recently, I think, that was denied and it's just too impossible to even uh, think about the evaluation because they were they were so sick with ascites, portal hypertension, and all those different things. So not truly arranged, but if someone says they, they've been told they were kind of early, we'd say, have them call us. But if they're in their 20s, should we suspect as a Sure, yeah, and we're still going to you know, run it through the process because uh, they will, we had someone recently, I forgot the situation, but their male may have been close to 30, and as it turned out, Dr. Genick and Dr. Jeff Kahn, who's the medical director for hepatology, they both, they hemmed and hawed, they said, you know what, no sense in having them come in, it's just not doable. So I think we're going to move on with Alex a little bit of the overall uh, non-liver transplant referral our, referrals, our process. So uh, Randy is a liver specialist, as you can see, uh, even though I take some of those calls too, but I, I um, uh, Randy obviously was here from the beginning with this program. Uh, so I will take care of all the other referrals, so I do appreciate you uh, calling us directly with, with most of these. Um, and it's a bit of a process. Uh, when we mean intake, we mean taking in information, complete as much, as much information as possible for these patients so we know what their, um, their challenges are and we know how to properly refer them. Um, so we try to grab as much information as possible and this, like I said, will allow us to do a correct physician selection, referral, uh, and communication to their staff. Um, and this is important, that way we can also um, fast track them through the system because if you just call in on your own um, and um, try to find a physician, you may not find a physician that is transfusion free friendly or on our staff uh, or our selection or selected group. Um, and then you can get an appointment pretty far out. Um, and typically, if they call us, it's because it's urgent. So we want to get a patient in uh, as, as soon as possible. So uh, it's uh, advantageous to come through us, that way you enjoy the full scope uh, of, of the program. Um, insurance obviously is an issue, so uh, a lot of times we will get a question of will you accept this type of insurance or X type of insurance. Um, we accept everything that's PPO, okay, if you want to look at it that way. Everything else is a question mark. But please run it through us anyway because you also meant we also heard a lot about LOAs and Randy will be talking about that too. We want to have an opportunity to, to bring them in. A lot of times it's a process of navigation, that last point there. Um, we truly uh, handhold these patients through because obviously um, um, we want to help them. We want to help them come through our system if possible. Most of the time they can, but because of all the roadblocks, that insurance present, it becomes very difficult for them. We can help them with language, with um, um, anything that, uh, any type of support, so they know what to even talk to or say to these medical groups so they can get an opportunity to come through. A lot of times these patients are patients that are even an HMO patient that have been um, denied time after time in their own group, and they don't know what to do. So they contact us thinking that they can't even make it over here. But because of those denials, it actually makes it possible for them to come over. So we're able to help them navigate through, through this crazy system of insurance so they can hopefully qualify and come, and come through here. So that's very, very important. So that's why it's so important to, to, uh, to come through to us. We track all of this too. So um, all this information that's fed through to us, we're able to share with the clinics. Um, we are working directly with the physician clinics. So... And that's another reason why you want to come through to us, where we're able to immediately contact uh, a physician staff 
their nursing staff. Um, sometimes we're, we're thinking of a certain patient, a certain uh, physician, and, uh, and we'll even be redirected because of a certain subspecialty within the group. Uh, usually we know who they are, but you know, this is always important to know. We don't want to send someone to just gynecology when they should be gyno euro, right? And that type of thing. So it's really, really important to go through us so we can help navigate through that. Yes, David. Alex, let me ask you this uh, regarding navigation. Um, is USC um, working with or trying to contract relationships with the Kaiser and the nurse artist network in California per se? I know other hospitals are contracting to do stuff that Kaiser can't do, as an example. Uh, is USC working with any discussions uh, with them? So I know we have a special relationship with them, depending on specialty. I know we're doing a lot of spine for them. Do you want to speak to that, Dr. Jamal? So, uh, we have a relationship with, uh, we have a relationship with Kaiser for complex spine procedures and um, also liver. And there are some special occasions where if it's a complex procedure that they don't, that, that uh, exceeds, like the, the clinical trials. And sometimes they will contact us. So like a micro valve that they can't do? And that's, a, that's a good question. I don't want to hold out that, uh, but I do, I do know that we've had some patients where for some unique circumstance we ended up uh, entering into a nail awake. So that would be a, a special circumstance. Oh, and the reference to is all the same with Kaiser. We have had a couple of meetings and discussion with uh, their regional office about being the preferred tertiary provider for uh, referrals, transfusion-free witness patients when they feel they can accomplish that. Now it's fallen off a little bit. I think they're still working on some internal uh, things going on, but that was a discussion so that they would have a go-to place almost immediately if they feel they're not able to route it to one of their specialty centers within Kaiser Permanente. We're working on it. Um, so that's really uh, uh, one of the big hats on that I wear. Um, you know, we want to try to get uh, the patients through. So what your take home, if if you if you um, if I can ask you to do that, is to uh, don't second guess on the insurance. Contact us anyway, or have the if it's not if it's um, not emergent, have the, have the patient contact us directly. We'd be happy to help them. Be happy to try to navigate. Um, so, so we can get them through our, through our system. Some have gotten to the point where they'll even do cash pay just to get another opinion. If it needs to get to that, that that's fine too. Um, but, uh, and some have even held out because of it being elective procedures or they've gone out and actually changed their insurance so they can come on uh, and go through us and not have to go through the hassle of navigation. Um, so whatever it takes, we'll, we're, we're here to, to help them with that. I think I touched a little bit on that insurance insurance authorization eligibility. Uh, we keep mentioning uh, um, uh, LOAs. Did you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, so LOAs, letters of agreement. That's what when when we are not contracted with a insurance uh, provider and uh, we're able to to meet with them in terms of rates. That all happens in the background. That's what we call um, uh, financial clearance. A lot of this happens on our transfers too. So when we have a transfer or a, a patient that we want to have come in from another facility, we'll do a, a clinical trans, uh, clinical clearance, and then financial clearance when we they agree to an LOA, so we can get this patient over here and get their surgery performed, um, get that emergent situation taken care of, and a lot of times they all they're sent back to do their physical therapy uh, and other things too. You have a question. Medi-Cal, we're limited. There are, there are certain circumstances where we're able to, to have them come in. That also is LOA. Do you want to talk about that? I wanted to make a comment about the LOA transfer. I'm sorry to interrupt. So, you know, one thing that happens in the world of insurance is that if they have elective patients, then it may be a dogfight sometimes to get a patient access to care. If they have an emergency problem, then we find that it's they're much more amenable to pressured suggestions. So if you have a patient that's slowly bleeding on the outside who's a witness, then that, that's where the, the pressure needs to go to the insurance company. So they, 
they get very nervous about their own liability in a circumstance where they have a patient who's in a contracted hospital of theirs that they don't have that service. And so it's very, it's much easier for us to get a patient over, say, after a bile duct injury when the patient's sitting in the hospital and is sick and they can't fix their bad pancreatitis. And I would say that, you know, your, your slow bleeding Jehovah Witness patient who's got a hemoglobin of, of 10, now it's down to 8, is a patient that they're, they're going to want to get that patient off their hands. So I would say that that's where the, the liaison community and the families can start putting pressure. They can just say, you know, you don't have this capability. Uh, we want to go somewhere else. And it's likely to happen, I think. We've seen that a number of times, actually. So with, with witness patients in particular. Yes, sir? So the patient goes into a community hospital, Medi-Cal, and the hospital cannot provide the services he needs. Mm -hmm. What obligation does that hospital have uh, to care for that patient? And then he's still not stable to leave the hospital. Well, a lot of a lot of the patients with Medi-Cal have managed Medi-Cal now, and that, that may be something that we could do a letter of agreement for. Do you have any comments about the med pure Medi-Cal? I mean, we have a Medi-Cal contract. Yeah, we do have some contracts. A few non uh, as you know, uh, on the exchange, there's different plans, and there's so many different plans, but we do have contracts with some of the, the managed uh, Medi-Cal and uh, we have been very, very successful, as uh, Dr. Selby just said, for transfers for um, Medi-Cal uh, or managed Medi-Cal. We get a letter of agreement for specialty care that is not within the capacity of the transferring institution or the contracted hospital. Do they have an obligation to the hospital itself to see the patients that it's there for? It's complex. It depends on the circumstances, I suppose. Um, they could claim that they do have the capability. Um, so it's it's a. It, I don't think there's any clear. It depends on the facts of the case. Uh, I mean, I would. Uh, if I may interject, Sarah, uh, uh, is there any known uh, state law, local law that governs this situation? So, if a patient is in the emergency department, so I'm sure you are familiar with EMTALA. If the patient is in the emergency department, the request for transfer to any hospital, and it's a request for higher level of care for whatever reason, that the, the facility that, where the patient is at is not able to provide the service to stabilize an emergency medical condition, federal law requires that uh, a receiving hospital to accept that patient if we have capacity. So let me give you a scenario. A patient goes to the emergency department and has um, some bleeding condition of the stomach and the patient is, um, for whatever reason, the surgeon at that facility is not prepared or cannot uh, manage that case. Uh, well, let me use an actual, an actual case. A hospital called us and said, I have a 19-year-old with a perforated esophagus. I haven't done a perforated esophagus in 15 years. I don't feel prepared to handle this case. And um, because the patient was in the emergency department, that phone call obligated us to accept that patient regardless of their insurance status. Okay. Now, once the patient is admitted to the hospital, that federal law no longer applies. And then it's uh, uh, about negotiating all of the things that you do probably every day. It's complex. Or the patient, uh, if they're well educated and they can ask uh, and pose those requests, that is true. They, then the hospital has to start looking for ways to um, address that condition, uh, which in, may include bringing the surgeon to the site or transferring the patient. More, more often, it's transferring. More Thanks, good questions. So uh, we're going to wrap up in our time. It's just about uh, at the limit here. Um, in relation to, oh, this is just a funny slide, but <laughs> it kind of is applicable, though. <laughs> it costs a lot to be admitted these days. Um, so Alex talked about the payers, so that's just the list of uh, the various payers that we may work with. Again, PPO is easier, but we can work with others as well. If you give us a call, we'll try to help out. Uh, that was that. So physician to physician consultation, just briefly on that, as we mentioned, 
that's a, I think it's a challenging situation when you have someone maybe that wants to treat the patient, doesn't have the expertise, and how do you, you know, mitigate that? Because um, we, we like to be helpful that way. So just a minute or two on that, maybe uh, from the group. What's your experience been? What would you like to see? What kind of process do you think works best when you're at an outside hospital and you're trying to uh, help them without transferring them to a place like ours, let's say? Any comment on that? Charlie? Um, are the physicians here willing to consult with us? So there's a willingness. We have certain uh, physicians within uh, most specialties who have agreed to consult. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I'm going to ask Dr. Silva to chime in because we were talking about this last night as far as the real, uh, realistic scenario. Go ahead. Yeah, I had a presentation with CCLA and anesthesia on the council. And spoke about the very topic about an hour you can have for treatment with a patient. They said four hour tops. And I remember Dr. Strong before mentioning the longer period of time. And they wanted to talk to us about direction. Oh, for sure, for sure. I remember uh, a physician called anesthesiologist from Tennessee, and we connected him with Dr. Strum to talk about that. So you know, sometimes we have more of a dynamic situation, maybe even bleeding or what have you. So maybe, uh, Rick, would you mind talking about what's realistic when we have a situation where the expertise is so key and to, to be able to talk someone through it? You mean for A and H? You're talking about right? Yeah. yeah. I mean. Well, um, well, the the tops. I mean, if you cool. Cool the blood and tops goes on and on. So the, you, you can theoretically almost run the operating room like a blood bank if you have a cooler and you keep it cold. The other thing was the clotting, and there there are rockers that we put the the blood the, the bags on, and then there's the the bags that we use have a natural anticoagulant. So it's they're called CPD bags, citrate, phosphate, and dextrose. So it's a natural anticoagulation and on a rocker, plus or minus the cooler, if you think it's going to be a while. So it's really, that that is not an issue. The preservation of the blood in the in the operating room is really not that much of an issue. I think sometimes they make it they make it seem like an issue, and, but it, it really, I mean, we, we, we use the ANH at every hospital that I practice, but this is the only place where we have a real program, and it, and it is, you know, We've been through it and through it and through it and through it, and it's we're very comfortable and it's not complicated at all. So, mm -hmm. yes, sir. How would the logistics work of a physician to physician council? I, I mean, do we call you or Alex? I mean, we don't even know which ones for what specialty or subspecialty. So, what really logistically would make sense? Because I, you know, I don't want to drive you crazy with every phone call I get. So, how would that work? Yeah. So that's yeah. Thank you. I want Dr. Silva comment too. So, if you call us, because we would have we have identified those and certain specialists who are willing to consult, and then at a certain point in time, they may say consultation just won't do it for the patient over. But if you we are twenty four seven, we carry the pager, we trade off the pager, so. Feel free to give us a call if it's, even if it's a matter of just talking through it. Maybe it will work, maybe it won't. We don't mind. You can call me. Do you have a list of specialties that you already know? We don't even know the doctors. Right, right. But if we do the specialty, it's oh, sure, like right. call and have that filter up front. Got it. Instead of just calling you saying, by the way, do you have a consultant? That's a good point. We can provide that. We can develop a little list of our specialties. A specialist who have agreed to provide consultation. Yeah, we don't know. Okay. But as far as the, the you know, think about the issue of uh, when, when it goes beyond just consultation, when it really necessitates having the patient here versus someone like you talking to, talking a uh, surgeon through the practice. Well, I, I think so. You'd be surprised at how much unfamiliarity there is out there with not cell savers so much, but maybe you wouldn't be surprised, but. Just with the A and H, and so I think you know it's it, and I think that the reason a lot of times that they throw up objections are because they don't have any experience with it and they're uncomfortable. So, and I think sometimes the 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 interrogatory to have an answer is genuine. And I think sometimes they'll throw it out to you just to kind of cloud the field because they don't want to talk about. It. We're happy to talk to anybody about it, and you know, if, especially if they're genuinely interested, we want to see the whole practice get promoted. It's, it's it's a real valuable tool. 
you, I'm sure you had the idea that Jesus this simple is as simple as they say, and you can stop all these one and two unit transfusions. What a what a boon that would be. Any other questions? Thanks. Like I said, more about that. We, if you have comments, uh, you know, we'd love to have some discussion about that because I know it comes up and it's something that uh, sometimes could, well, when you have a patient need insurance or other reasons that were mentioned, they, they need to remain where they are, then it, it's best to have those doctors you know, get more um, education. So as we wrap up, uh, the patient transfer, just to go through our process so you'll know it, uh, we'll pull this all up. So as uh, was mentioned earlier, we have our transfer center. Uh, 1855 USC beds. Uh, our goal is to make sure that that process is uh, uh, timely and efficient. So if we get a call in regards to a patient transfer, then we will uh, we will alert our transfer center nurses so they're aware. Hey, a call may be coming in from a case manager, from a physician, to do that physician to physician. You know, uh, have that discussion. I should say. Uh, what's happened sometimes, right, Alex, is that. We may provide that number, we tell the patient or a liaison member even, make sure it's the clinical staff contact, and then we have, uh, we've had a case where a liaison member or a family member, they're calling the, the transfer center, they're calling us, Randy, Alex, what's going on? We need to talk to the doctor, we need to talk to the case manager to get the clinical information, because they, as you see here, um, they will get the medical records uh, and get the information to the physician so they can review the records, look at the financial eligibility, so for that process to work best, we, we try to make sure we alert them. We want them also to notify us because uh, from time to time, at the end, uh, we don't get notified. We find out about a patient who's been here, what, for 18, 24 hours. We had no idea. Then the paperwork's not filled out, and there's a question. Will they accept albumin, cell saver, A&H? They're being rushed to uh, operating room IR. So for that process to be neat and, and, uh, and timely, again, that notification. So I, in the main, I think that's happening with a lot of uh, you members here, but we just want to reemphasize that. Please give us a call so we can help facilitate that transfer process. Speak to the family too so they know. Anything more on that, Alex, you wanted to highlight? Don't hand the phone over to the family member. We need you to continue to be to liaise and be the liaison. Uh, you're first on scene. Uh, because there's a lot of things that we can talk to you about and we can uh, coach you, or for lack of a better word, or guide you, I should say, um, that we can't tell the patient uh, or the patient family, and then we don't want to have to talk to them and give them small, um, um, false expectations. So, um, because these transfers take a little bit of time. So if we can work through you and continue to work through you, that's really, really important for us, uh, and we'll be in touch with you, and then you can uh, be that contact with, uh, with the patient. Thanks. Any comments on your end about that? Barry? Uh, is there any need for us to have these numbers? Um, not really. I mean, <laughs> well, just, just so that uh, if you call us and then, um, directly. yeah, directly, you can, you can tell the case manager, whoever's uh, on scene helping to facilitate that transfer, give them our number, and then we can, you know, but sometimes based on the situation, you know, we don't mind you having that number just as long as you know, we, we use it appropriately. There was another Armando. So, so really just sum, up, sum that up too because Mark can do it without us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can, yeah. Yeah, that'd be, I know you want to be involved. I mean, once, you know, HIPAA and all that, so uh, you know, sometimes we'll get a call, how's the patient doing? We don't mind sharing certain information, but we are duty bound to, to, to make sure that we follow the HIPAA requirement too. Al. Yeah, that's a good point. So that number is available at the hospital. Helpful. Okay, thank you. So we're, we're wrapping up here. Um, I think I'm going to, this is patient rounds with Alex does. I'm going to skip that because we're going to finish up our time if you have any other questions. Uh, lastly, patient experience. So we talked about that. Uh, we have that as our quality goal uh, that we're measured on. And uh, our goal for this past fiscal year, we're going to continue, I believe, is to reduce these uh, SRM, safety risk management reports. And what we're talking about is um, we have two types of reports, feedback report, and then a safety event. And so I'm being quite transparent here. We had a safety 
event that we took care of. Dr. Hall mentioned our, our huddle, the tiered huddle arrangement that goes up to the uh, C-suite. And so a uh, patient of Dr. Selby's actually, that we had an issue where a uh, nurse practitioner ordered a product that was not appropriate. We, they found out about it later, didn't get the product, but the uh, uh, family member and the patient found out later, asked us just to make sure. So we've already in service the interventional radiology suite where it happened, the uh, manager for that uh, department I met with, met with the uh, endoscopy manager. We're meeting um, next Friday with the nurse practitioner. And fortunately, this is where education, uh, where education is important and not being punitive, but saying, okay, if we miss this because of lack of proper identification, whatever the case may be, we can really manage these fallouts better and hopefully reduce them. And, and we're happy that to now find out we're going to embark upon a certain project involving risk management and quality that will really look deeply into our overall transfusion-free program to tighten up the structure even more so to have better quality assurance. So our goal has been to reduce uh, fallout so that 95% of our inpatient population should have no fallouts. We're doing pretty good right now. <laughs> You've been tracking that because I'm measured by Dr. Hall on that, so we've got to come out 95, maybe 96%. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so that's it. If any other concluding uh, questions or comments you have before we wrap up? Uh, we can entertain a few, Jeff, for any of us. I have a couple questions. Have you broken out the number of transfusion patients per patient in the general population in the hospital? Let's see how well it continues to be broken out. Yes, we do, we do report on that, how many inpatients and outpatients. So it's still a small population. You look at the thousands of patients that uh, come through. Uh, we usually have about 200 plus inpatients and somewhere in the neighborhood about 3,500 outpatients as far as encounters. So uh, growing that, we talk about business, but more so looking at managing that po patient population best. So if we look at other individuals, other patients who request or would like to be transfusion free, that's where our patient blood management process really is important because maybe at a certain point, uh, the patient, uh, they can be managed in a transfusion avoidance situation, but we have a lot more requests growing. What would you say, Alec, maybe the last year or so, uh, I would say about 20, 30 uh, percent, we've seen growth. We have some patients who are identified that way that are not, but uh, in terms of the general population, still small, but, but growing. And follow-up, uh, based on that, how has this affected overall well, I, I think um, I don't. I don't think it's made much difference yet. But we're just since we have the data and we have the we have um, a, a lot of, of points on the data that are that will I think translate into pressure points for both service lines, individual physicians, departments. So now we're, I think we're armed with information that will allow us to, to put some pressure back on those service lines and departments and, and with some constructive criticism for how they can help the hospital and the program reduce the transfusion for the non-witness patients. For the witness patients, we're doing great. I mean, I'm really happy. And you said there's 200, that's 200 uh, inpatient visits and about 3,500 outpatient visits per year, so it's not a trivial number. So there's a lot of opportunity for for fallouts, as you might imagine. So, but uh, so just like Randy uh, said, he has goals that he's measured on. I have mine, and I have to report to my box. And uh, we are embarking on a supported program that actually Dr. Selby participates in, and has recommended for the hospital. And um, I'm really pleased that we're going to be launching that program, which is a uh, using the same style of giving the physician information, educating them on practice, and just asking them to take a look at it, how it often changes practice, and providing them with uh, case by case, unit by unit review of their blood utilization practices, just by doing that practice. Uh, other uh, Hospitals have shown a reduction in blood utilization. So we're going to be launching that program, and our hope is that we'll have that program up and running within the next 90 days. In addition, we're working with uh, some of our faculty. We talked about the Indiana Blood Management, but actually looking at a uh, formal clinic program. And uh, finally, uh, implementing the data 
has said that uh, Dr. Selby has been working on in using that to, to manage our practice and uh, monitor our, our success there. Our hopes are that we will reduce our, our overall organization over the next year by a minimum of 15%, but my hope is that we can achieve a 30% reduction in a period of, once the program is in full force, by 30%. Those are lofty goals. Uh, we will come back next year with a report back on how we did. Anything else? If not, uh, thank you so well. Wow. <laughs> well, I'm just sitting here and listening to uh, from the early beginnings and having these opportunities to come listen to some of those uh, physicians and helping us to be more savvy on what to ask, who to call, and how to get a good response to help our patients. So we appreciate allowing us to come in and be able to have access to you and call on you teaching us what we can do to help our community so that they can honor you. Well, I, I think on the flip side, you know, the, the medical community in general really owes a bigger debt, I think, to the witness uh, patients because it's really served as a, a perfect control. You know, you don't get a, a perfect control like this very often. And, and in having a perfect control, it allows you to have studies that are fairly pure. And then, you know, the outcomes are perhaps a surprise to much of the world of medicine, but the, the cost reduction that it waits is going to be enormous. And not just the cost reduction in use of blood product, but the cost reduction in lengths of stay and infection rates and maybe tumor recurrences. So so what you know what you guys have known instinctively all along, the, the rest of the world is you know, just discovering now. And so that that's we owe a big debt to y'all. On that note, thank you all for coming. Hopefully we'll see you maybe the same time next year. Um, and so I get, at this point, I'd like to open the, to questions, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if we have time, if I, a few minutes. So, yes. Um, on the North Campus, Absolutely. They, they cover the, the whole campus, uh, our services, yes. You mentioned that they have pediatric capabilities. They don't have an inpatient pediatric unit. They have a, a newborn, well, well newborn, and a neonatal intensive care. They do occasionally um, admit uh, adolescents for like appendicitis, simple procedures. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, they don't have an inpatient pediatric unit. So I should clarify that. Yes. Our, our Orange County facilities currently, um, we are opening a uh, practice for um, cancer in uh, Brea, but that's still in the development. And uh, we have physicians who are currently uh, staffing, and I, I'm not sure we could say that our transfusion food service is necessarily there, but we do have some of our USC physicians who practice at St. Jude Hospital. And um, Torrance Memorial, we have physicians that are at um, Long Beach, so they're, they're spread out. Yes? I noticed on your site map, you have some uh, like clinics maybe down in the San Diego area. Uh, you see that correctly? No, we don't have uh, clinics in San Diego, um, but we do receive uh, patients uh, from um, all the way in from San Diego to Las Vegas. Uh, and as far north as uh, Bakersfield and Fresno, although I have to say that we receive patients from all over the country, uh, depending on uh, the specialty. Uh, many patients will fly in uh, because our specialists are, are known to be able to provide services that aren't available elsewhere, so 
Um, we frequently will facilitate transfer from, for example, Florida, um, Texas, all, all over. Yes. We have many of our faculty who practice at Huntington Memorial, but uh, we do not, not have an official affiliation. But our our physicians provide um, surgical services uh, at uh, Huntington. So, for example, um, cardiac surgery we have at Huntington. Our uh, obstet uh, obstetrics practice is also located at Huntington because we don't have an OB program here at this time. So, is there any branch? To affiliate, uh, we would love to affiliate, um, but I think that's something that's a little above my pay grade. <laughs> so our policies, um, Randy spends a great deal of time uh, daily interacting with our transfer service to ensure that patients who are referred, um, they are very familiar with our program, our transfusion-free program, and he works to ensure that um, if a patient is referred, then he or, or Alex are uh, linked in at the very beginning to ensure that the um, process is, is on, on point. We're going to talk about that in our presentation later, Yes, sir. I can tell you that uh, we do have a list of uh, current programs that we have existing contracts, but that should not limit um, because one of the things that uh, our finance department spends a lot of time, because we are a referral and when patients exceed the ability of an, uh, a, a particular insurance provider, to provide the service, then we will negotiate uh, what we call a letter of agreement. We do hundreds of letters of agreement every month. Uh, yeah, Dr. Selby, I really appreciate the comment and I look forward to asking this. Because mm -hmm. uh, normally when we get the phone calls, it's from the coast of that. Right. <laughs> from that standpoint, yeah. So That's too. So, yeah, <laughs> just the stunts of that being shown. So, so just so you know that every all the physicians that practice at USC is a closed medical staff. So all the physicians are represented in provider contracting, and so we're all this. So, if, so we, are, you know, whatever contracts I have, then my partners all have, and the ones in urology. So that won't be any different. Okay. On the other hand, if you're talking about the a surgeon who practices at Pasadena at Huntington, that that sometimes that happens. You know, some frequency that patients get redirected there, but not within our own program. You won't, you won't find them getting redirected within the program. Thank you. Yes, sir. Both of you are certain. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you just mentioned the use of an injury evaluation Well, yeah, so let me address that. So first of all, um, 
we would never take somebody with A and H down to a hemoglobin of two or five. Those are patients who, when, when the surgery was all done, we, we might go down to eight, you know, on a on a pre-op hemoglobin with A and H. But when the surgery was all done, that's the hemoglobin that they were left with. So in general, the patients that you're talking about are slower blood loss kind of patients. So so the sooner we see them, the better. But again, the slower blood loss ones are the ones that are usually better tolerated. So. So on, on these patients, if, if they need to go to the operating room with a hemoglobin of five, we'll take them to the operating room. And I think that's, that's usually not that impossible of a scenario. What's hard with those patients is say they come out and they're three and a half, four, how do you manage them? And so that's a, that's a different skill set. That means you cool them off, you don't draw any blood, you augment them right away. You, maybe you keep them on the ventilator so they don't do any extra work. You, you know, sometimes you paralyze them and sedate them and you cool them. So that, that's a, that's a, that's more of an extreme control and management, and that's, but it's still, that's a pathway is still a, a very good one and very possible. So I, I don't think that there's any patient we wouldn't say, let's give it a run and see. And I, and I do think that most of the patients, and that's usually patients that have colorectal bleeding, I would say most often, and you know, the transfer has been difficult, maybe it's insurance, maybe it's the reluctance of the physician up there, or wherever that might be. Uh, and so, but when they come in, generally, I think, again, we haven't looked at the data on that, where they're, most of them get through, but I think most of them we get through. You know, I, I remember some of the hemoglobin's in that three, four range that survived it. Yes. Do one more, you think there's one more? Yeah, I'm sorry. No. One more question? Is there a question about the How did you turn them on the minutes before off? Based on So, you know, if, if, if we have a non-witness patient, we'll pull off one unit, sometimes two if it's a big case. On a witness patient, it's, it's all balanced against how, how big an operation is this. Because we know that, we, you know, we're not going to be able to give two units of A&H blood and then give, you know, four units of, of allogeneic blood. That's just not going to happen. So, if we're, if we're thinking this is a spinal surgeon, we might lose five or six units. And we're going to augment them like crazy before surgery. And like I said, we'll pull off six or seven units in order to guard against uh, the hemorrhage. But but the, the part of the beauty of knowing the range of blood loss on these cases is you, you kind of can do the calculus up front and say, okay, if I'm going to need, if I'm going to lose three liters, I better have six or seven units ready. If I'm going to need six or seven units, I'm going to keep hitting them with the erythropoietin until they get 18 or 17, and then we're just going to take it off. We'll drop them down to the hemoglobin of 9, and we'll be sitting there with several units. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions in the back? Well, you know, I struggled about to tell you about what we have for that, and we just, you know, 30 minutes wasn't enough. So, actually, the biggest problem in your patient group is the need for anticoagulants to prevent stroke. And so, being on anticoagulants represents a bleeding risk just by the very nature. So, we now have been able to figure out that 92% of the blood clots that form in atrial fibrillation come from the left atrial appendage. So if we had a way to exclude, eliminate, remove, or plug off the left atrial appendage, then we would solve that problem. And now we do. We have FDA-approved device that we can actually put as a plug into the left atrial appendage, and the clinical data is exactly equivalent to anticoagulants. Uh, puncture, better than minimally invasive, a, a venous puncture in the right groin. That's called the Watchman procedure. So that's that's actually common common practice for us now. So it's called the Watchman device. And if you're writing this down, that's by Boston Scientific. So if you search the Boston Scientific website, there'll there'll be some patient education about the Watchman device. Sir. There are a couple of problems. It's not it's not greatly reimbursed. 
So there's a cadence for new device technology. The first thing that happens is the FDA approves it, and then the development of a procedure code and a reimbursement strategy often lag a considerable amount of time behind that. So, so we have a very cooperative administration, fortunately, that allows us to innovate on the fly because it's essential to what we do. So, and also, if you, if you make no mistakes and have short length of stays and have great te technical skill at this, then you can get by on the very slim contributions to the margin on some of these high technology things. So that's kind of why it isn't really embraced. And it's not the kind of thing you can do one, one a month. It's got to become routine. So that's another advantage of being a referral center is these things that are a little more technologically advanced. We, you know, we're not truly smarter. We just get more practice. So, so we're blessed to have a situation where we, we can practice these and get really good.